Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have an absolutely horrible, no good, very bad, <laughs> awful show for you today without any interesting news or commentary. April Fool's. <laughs> very, very nicely done, Robbie. <laughs> Although sometimes you borderline start the show that way, but it's not the 1st of April. <laughs> April Fool's Day, of course, is a legendarily terrifying holiday for journalists, especially <laughs> clickbait chasing journalists. We're like, wow, I can't believe that happened. Oh my God, what a great cancel culture story. Right. Now this is made up. In right. Well, we're very careful uh, with the coverage today, but it is still so good that you might think some of these stories <laughs> are a creation of a prank holiday. Sure. Sure. So let's get into it. Up first, uh, we start in the Middle East where things are not quite so funny. In Israel, where pressure against the Israeli prime minister is mounting, thousands of protesters gathered in Jerusalem Sunday, standing outside parliament, demanding the removal of Benjamin Netanyahu and calling for new elections. This followed Saturday's protest in Tel Aviv and a separate anti-government protest. Many Israelis believe that Netanyahu is putting his political survival ahead of the nation and the hostages. Last night, before going under for a hernia operation, Netanyahu held a press conference in response to say that new elections would only benefit Hamas. In addition, from harsher words from the U.S., Germany also wading into the war of words and switching tones on Israel, with the German chancellor visiting Israel last week and asking Netanyahu publicly, how can the goals of the war justify such terribly high costs? Supporting Israel is viewed as an historic duty in Germany because of the Holocaust, so even murmurs of questioning that support is quite significant. And of course, as millions of Christians celebrated Easter over the weekend, Pope Francis called for ceasefire as he presided over Easter Mass on Sunday. Now, in his address before thousands of worshipers, the Pope said, quote, I appeal once again that access to humanitarian aid be ensured to Gaza and call once more for the prompt release of the hostages seized on last October 7th and for an immediate ceasefire in the Strip. Pope Francis's plea comes as Politico published a report that the Department of Defense is considering funding a peacekeeping force in Gaza. According to the report, the Biden administration is in the preliminary stages of planning such an operation to help stabilize post-war Gaza, including a multinational or Palestinian peacekeeping force. The plan would not include U.S. troops on the ground, mm. apparently. Meanwhile, a 14-day siege of al-Shifa hospital ended this weekend as the Israeli military withdrew, leaving what was Gaza's largest medical facility destroyed, with at least 300 bodies found dead so far among the ruins. CNN reports that the exact death count is hard to ascertain because Israeli troops buried bodies inside the facility and bulldozed nearby roads. A journalist working with CNN described al-Shifa as a, quote, horror movie featuring bodies crushed by bulldozers and entire families dead and decomposing. Survivors are malnourished, with some reporting that six people shared one bottle of water a day. And survivors reported to CNN that the Israeli military appeared to fire at hospital buildings, windows, and at anyone who was caught moving between the hallways. 3,000 people were sheltering at al-Shifa at the time. Recall that prior to the al-Shifa raid back on November 15th, the IDF claimed the hospital was the basis of a Hamas command center. A subsequent investigation by the Washington Post, published on December 21st, concluded that, quote, the evidence presented by the Israeli government falls short of showing that Hamas had been using the hospital as a command and control center. So there is a lot of news there. Obviously, with Easter and the Pope's call for a ceasefire, there was a lot of back and forth discourse about the um, validity or appropriateness of using uh, the holiday to push for a ceasefire, whether or not that's in fact very much in line in the spirit of Christian teachings, Jesus's teachings, or whether or not it was sacrilegious to be quote unquote injecting uh, politics into the holiday. Um, but what is I think pretty clear is that there's a lot of pushback both here in the United States because of humanitarian concerns and in Israel in part because of these more political concerns. Especially interesting, I think, is the pushback that you're seeing from the family members of Israeli hostages who don't see Benjamin Netanyahu as working in, in, in line with their own interest in getting their family members returned. Yes, uh, he seems to be in significant political trouble. Um, uh, I think pulled in, in many different directions. I mean, with even very, I think, hardline people, somewhat skeptical of him. Obviously, this this disaster, this terrorist attack did unfold under his watch following his strategy of, uh, of 
almost implicitly encouraging Hamas uh, and supporting it as a le le delegitimizing force for uh, for the Palestinians to have their own their own country. Um, Hamas being the even more radical choice of them, thinking that that would make it less likely for them to get their political goals met. That whole strategy seems to have obviously blown up in Netanyahu's face, and you know, he was facing legal issues that had nothing to do with, uh, or very little to do with, the Gaza situation, obviously, even before October 7th, had fallen from power and returned to power again. So uh, so I think it is an open question how well he is able to hold on at this point. Yeah, I think the— um, I, I, th I should say, I think it's— yeah. I think it's also an open question whether different leadership would, in fact, pursue different policies in Gaza. It is not at all clear to me that there is a significant will in Israel to do to do otherwise or to end the war effort until uh, Hamas is utterly and totally destroyed. So I'm, I'm not sure there would be much of a difference if someone else came into power. Yeah, it is important to note that the uh, protests in Israel are not in line with the humanitarian protests that we're seeing across the world, they're much more pointedly frustrated with Netanyahu's leadership, again, bound up in large part with how the hostages are being treated. Polls of Israeli citizens show that they are overwhelmingly in support of the siege, like overwhelmingly, yes. over 90 percent in support of how much force and the kind of force that has been being used in the Gaza Strip. However, this question of what uh, is going on with the hostages, I think, is really being thrown into sharp relief. Remember, there was the incident at the end of last year where three hostages were shot by IDF troops. I think that was in some way a turning point as hostages are released and speak to the press about how they were concerned about being killed by uh, IDF bombs while they were in captivity by Hamas. I think that also shines a light on whether or not they are being protected and whether or not the priority Majority of the Israeli government has been hostages. And then just over the weekend, Christiane Amanpour at CNN interviewed a family member of a hostage who said that Israel threatens families to go along with the government line or else that their family member will be moved down the uh, priority list in terms of mm. who gets uh, recovered in these exchange negotiations, which is a really explosive revelation. So I think it's important to understand that that, is, that sort of narrative is really driving discontent within Israel as opposed to a belief that the bombing needs to stop, or right. the siege should stop, et cetera. Even though, as we can see from a number of hugely, widely attended protests over the weekend all across the world, including in the United States, there is a growing humanitarian um, interest in ending the kind of devastation that we saw coming out of Al Shifa Hospital and more broadly. I mean, the images that you see in the wake of that two-week siege are really devastating. The, the bodies have been there for some time decomposing in some instances to a skeletal state. Um, survivors talking about entire families buried alive, um, decomposing alive in this hospital complex where thousands of people had been sheltering uh, prior to the siege because these hospitals are some of the only remaining standing buildings. I mean, no longer, obviously. Um, and the few resources, medical resources, um, that still exist in the area could be found there. And now this one, which was, again, the largest hospital complex, in Gaza has now been reduced to um, basically ruins, a, sh a shell of itself, and the human uh, the human loss is still being tallied. Yes, uh, obviously frustration now with the German government weighing in as well. Um, you know, this is in addition, obviously, to uh, President Biden, less so, but other uh, members like. Chuck Schumer, uh, Kamala Harris, you know, indicating in very carefully calculated lang language support for a ceasefire of some duration, not of a not of a endless duration, because it is still um, our position that Hamas should go in line with Israel, and there's not enough of a will to contradict Israel on that. But clearly, some desire to to appease the the protesters um, uh, in the U.S. context, part of Joe Biden's own electorate, his own supporters, who are dissatisfied with that tact. Yeah, the political question of this can merit a whole other segment. The There has been some frustration, I think, even among good liberals, not just leftists, that there is uh, very clear messaging coming out of the Biden administration, reaching out to Haley supporters and other kind of conservative moderates, more so than there has been any real shift in trying to 
speak to the the frustrations yeah. that but are that is tangible right you're not just saying that's like a rhetorical no, there's a new ad put actual out. ads out right. by the Biden campaign saying hey Trump has said to you Haley voters we don't want you you're dead to us you, you have a home in the Democratic Party Yes, and what is the message exactly to Michigan voters other than there has been this creep on the ceasefire rhetoric. I think it's pretty broadly understood to be rhetoric and not an actual shift in policy position. We've seen um, Congress just prohibit aid to UNRWA through 2015 at the same time that it's sending more aid to Israel without any red lines being drawn to condition aid on the humanitarian behavior of Israel. The ICJ just issued another um, report basically double down, doubling down on its uh, initial uh, January uh, instructions for Israel to be in line with uh, the humanitarian rules of conflict, uh, basically kind of indicting them for not having followed through with their instructions the first time around. So with the Pope and everything, it really does feel like the international community is of, is of one mind about this, I think, compelled by what we're seeing coming out of Gaza. And yet the United States hasn't politically shifted in any meaningful way, except for perhaps trying to shore up its base with Nikki Haley voters, perhaps giving up on the idea that there is any way to appease voters in Michigan and around the country who are deeply disturbed by our own government's behavior here. We will have more rising right after this.